What an amazing day it has been so far. I know I'm sounding repetitive at this point, but it's been a true honor to, to help put together this conference. And I've been genuinely uh, humbled by the turnout, both of those of you in person, as well as the many of you who are tuning in through Zoom. Thanks again to the many sponsors who made these uh, events possible. The Dialogue Foundation, Claremont Graduate University's Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies, Utah State University's Leonard J. Arrington, Chair of Mormon History and Culture, the University of Utah's Mormon Studies Initiative, the Mormon History Association, the Smith Pettit Foundation, and the Sunstone Foundation. And before I go further, could someone close the door in the back since we have a lot of people uh, talking back there? I also want to thank those uh, who are here from Mike's own family who have been in and out throughout the day, including his children, Mary, Lisa, and Moshe, his niece, Alicia, his sister, Tr Trisha, and his former partner, Jan. Thank you for sharing your mic with us throughout uh, both of his life and now his death. And thank you again to the many presenters who delivered such wonderful remarks today. I had pretty high expectations and every presenter exceeded them, which is probably a great tribute to Mike's own legacy. Now we are now arriving at the, at the apex of our day long event. No pressure at all, Neil. The D. Michael Quinn Memorial Lecture sponsored by the Mormon Studies Program at Claremont Graduate University. When I first started thinking about who should deliver this plenary address, I wanted someone who wasn't necessarily inside the Mormon and Mormon studies community who could speak about both the broader legacy and the broader context uh, that Mike represented. And honestly, the first name that popped in my mind was Neil J. Young. Consider my surprise then when the very next day after I was considering this, while listening to the past present podcast during his What's Making History segment, Neil mentioned how much Mike's life and uh, scholarship meant to him. Recognizing that this was too good to overlook, I immediately reached out to Neil and he quickly agreed. Dr. Neil J. Young received his bachelor's degree from Duke, go blue devils from yesterday, and his PhD in history from Columbia University. He has taught at Princeton University, but has built his career as a nationally recognized uh, public historian. His first book, We Gather Together, The Religious Right and the Problem of Interfaith Politics, published by Oxford University Press, explores the rise of the religious right and how a number of conservative evangelicals, Catholics, and Mormons built a surprisingly strong and lasting alliance. He is currently working on a history of LGBTQ Republicans. But besides traditional forms of scholarship, Neil has demonstrated a broad reach through public venues. He has written numerous essays for Washington Post, The Atlantic, LA Times, Vox, Politico, Slate, and The New York Times. He was previously an op opinion columnist for HuffPost and is now a contributing column. He was previously an opinion columnist for HuffPost as now a contributing columnist, easy for me to say, for the week. Neil also co-hosts and produces the very popular history podcast, Past Present, which takes a trendy topic and places it in its historical context every week. Their episodes have been downloaded over a million times. He was also the co-creator and co-producer of the internationally acclaimed, I, I think that's fair to say, podcast series, Welcome to Your Fantasy, about the surprising and fascinating tale of the Chippendales. <laughs> that said, I can't think of any better person to wrap up this conference. So please join me in welcome Dr. Neil J. Young. Well, I think I'm uh, destined to have Chippendales in my biography for my rest, the rest of my life, and that was my own doing, so, uh, so be it. Um, thank you all for being here today. I want to give special thanks to Ben, and honestly, I think he deserves a round of applause for everything he has pulled off. 
for this talk, right? When Ben uh, reached out to me many months ago um, for this invitation, he said um, that I could do anything I wanted in this time. And that was both an exhilarating and a terrifying instruction. Um, but it, the thing that he really leaned into was that he wanted me to place uh, Mike Quinn in a broad historical context. And that's what I'm really gonna spend today doing. He mentioned past, present, how we take a trendy topic and place it, in, place it in its historical context. And clearly there's nothing more trending today than Michael Quinn. So um, with that, I wanna do three things today. Um, first, I want to think about Quinn and the broad contours of American history, to think about how historical context shaped his life and his scholarship, and also how we can understand his life and his scholarship in the context of that history or those histories. I'm gonna be spending most of my time on this section today, so don't get worried when it seems like it's going really long. Secondly, I want to look more closely at some aspects of his life and scholarship through the lens of LGBTQ history. And lastly, I want to briefly consider the legacy of Quinn's life and scholarship for all of us today. So to start at the beginning, Dennis Michael Quinn was born March 26, 1944 in Pasadena, California. That means tomorrow, of course, would be his 78th birthday. Gary Topping and his recent biography used the phrase ambiguous identities to talk about the different aspects of Quinn's early life and development. And Quinn himself described having a split identity. And this begins with his parents and the different identities at play in his childhood home. We've heard already about his father, Daniel Pena, a Chicano American man born in Arizona to Mexican immigrants, uh, grows up in Spanish speaking neighborhoods of Los Angeles. The shame he carries of his uh, Mexican, Mexican identity that leads him to cover that up in so many ways. Um, and this of course includes Daniel Pena changing his name to Donald Quinn, uh, which he takes from his childhood friend, Anthony Quinn, who goes on to be uh, the, the movie star. Uh, Quinn's mother, Joyce Workman, a redheaded woman of Irish descent, a sixth generation Mormon. Um, Quinn's father is nominally Catholic, but not particularly devout, but his very large family around them compared to Quinn's smaller Mormon relatives, um, not that they were small, but that there are not as many of them um, around him, meant that Quinn um, has said that his early life took place in a largely Catholic environment. His parents' marriage was difficult, um, was a difficult, difficult one, and it ended in divorce around the time that Michael was five. But these aspects of their background and their marriage and Quinn's childhood are useful to consider in the context of the age of post-World War II America and into the 1950s, and how especially Quinn's family and his childhood both fit within and stood apart from some of the major historical developments of this period. Now, Quinn is coming of age uh, during one of the more recognizable eras of American history, a period often more romanticized than accurately portrayed, you know, mid-century 1950s America, this period that's thought of as uh, post-war domestic tranquility, of material abundance, of suburbanization, of cultural conformity too, but if these were the themes of the era, and historians have challenged that in many ways, including uh, Stephanie Kuntz's um, uh, suggestion of this time period being caught in a nostalgia trap, um, they weren't necessarily the themes of Quinn's young life. And we can think about how the pressures and expectations of this period, especially around social conformity, would have shaped someone like Quinn and other Americans who didn't neatly embody or fulfill so many of the, era, of the era's cultural messages, its images, its representations. One way that Quinn's early life does align more closely with the spirit of the era, however, is with regard to religion and his religious faith. Although here too are aspects of some difference that are worth thinking about. So first of all, it's just worth noting that this is a period of heightened religiosity and this is very much tied to the anti-communist politics of the age, um, the national project to define the US in opposition to uh, Soviet Union's godless communism. And this manifests in many ways, 
one of which is church attendance and membership, which skyrockets in this time period. So just to give you a statistic, in 1930, only 47% of Americans belonged to a church. By 1960, nearly 70% did. Um, in the LDS context, you have a growth from in 1951, uh, 1950, there's 1 million members to 1970, there's about 3 million members. But this is being done under the leadership, of course, of church president David O. McKay. So this explosion of church membership, of sort of public expressions of religiosity, um, this is also the period where we're adding under God to the Pledge of Allegiance, and in God we trust a currency. Um, a lot of this, again, is seen as more performative than as sincere. Dwight D. Eisenhower, who you saw on the previous slide, um, when he was president-elect in 1952, he said, our form of government has no sense unless it is founded in a deeply religious faith, and I don't care what it is. That same year, 1952, was the year that Quinn was baptized um, in the LDS church as an eight-year-old. But before that, as I've mentioned, Quinn's parents were part of an interreligious or interfaith marriage that would have been pretty rare at the time. We don't see rates of interfaith marriage really um, growing until much later in the 20th century. And not only was interreligious marriage, marriages like theirs rare, but in many ways it was actively discouraged by religious leaders, uh, by social pressures, and even by the US government. In World War II, the US military um, distributes pamphlets to soldiers telling them not to marry people of other faiths because uh, the idea is that these are um, incompatible marriages that are um, fundamentally unsound and will lead to uh, divorce and therefore will weaken the strength of the nation. So Quinn's marriage, uh, sorry, Quinn's parents' marriage and its dissolution, for whatever reasons it happened, also speak to these tensions in the period over religious diversity, especially within the American family. And I think we can understand Quinn saying that he was used as a pawn in a religious tug of war battle, which is how he described his young life, um, as rooted in the particular dynamics of his family, and also uh, demonstrating some of the very anxieties of this period. At the same time, there's this appreciation for pluralism and religious tolerance, which makes sense if the overall cultural message is pro-religion. So you have a book like this, Will Herbert's book in 1955, Protestant Catholic Jew that is identifying these as the three major religions and the three sort of religious pillars of the nation. Um, this idea that the nation is moving away from its Protestant past or really from a conception of itself as a Protestant nation to one that recognizes uh, religious diversity as a strength of the nation. Now, Mormonism stands rather awkwardly in that tri-faith tri formulation mostly because it tends uh, to be placed under the Protestant umbrella in this tri-faith schema. And this leads to a lot of objections, both from Protestant leaders and Mormon leaders who don't think that this is uh, the right uh, connection. Um, but all this is to say, while Mormonism is not large enough to warrant its own designation in this cultural religious framework of tri-faith America, this is obviously a period of enormous growth for the LDS church that would have shaped Quinn's religious development and may have also influenced his lifelong interest in the institution of the church itself, which is expanding so much in this time. Okay, so these are just some of the few, but I think important um, cultural, political, and religious factors in this period that I see shaping Quinn's young life and development. I want to consider his development now as a scholar, which is happening at an early age. He is a precocious reader and a researcher. As a teenager, he is driven by curiosity and I think also by deep religious faith. These are intertwined for him and also reinforcing. And he is driven to his own research and study to answer the questions that arise for him. Uh, so before he enters college, he's read the entire Bible, all Mormon scriptures and other foundational works. Um, he's prepared indices of these works, done a line by line comparison of the 1830 Book of Mormon to other versions. I mean, this is just sort of an unbelievable um, show of himself at an early age of the talent and the skill and the interest and the dedication he has to close study of texts. Um, of historical texts that we'll see throughout his life. That research continues 
and grows when he enters BYU. As an undergrad in 1962, he discovers the Special Collections Library and spends lots of his time there, even skipping class to just be in the church documents um, and continues onward as he enrolls in the history program here, the master's, uh, the master's program here um, in history. Uh, the timing of this is of course fortuitous because it coincides with the LDS church's increasing openness of its archives. This is happening in the 1960s in general, but really achieved in 1970 when Apostle Howard Hunter is named church historian and basically opens wide the doors um, to historians to, to access those archives. So that's happening just a year before um, Quinn begins graduate study here at Utah. These are obviously some of the huge intellectual um, guides for him in these years, Davis Bitten here at Utah, um, and who hires him as a research assistant to go into those archives, at, at, um, to the LDS archives. Um, he also ends up working for Leonard Arrington, really the father of new Mormon history of which Quinn will play a part. Uh, and the rise that, Ar that Arrington and Quinn and others are leading of an objective, professionalized approach to Mormon history that is different from much of the apologetics and faith promoting historical narratives that have been previously written is sort of taking shape in this time period. Of course, Arrington famously later calls this time the Camelot years. Quinn himself described this time as every day uh, getting to go into the archives was like Christmas morning. And you know, that description really contrasts from how his research is so often described uh, that I saw coming up over and over again when I was really immersing myself in his biography and, and, and writings about him. Over and over again, we hear um, his research being painstaking and exhaustive. And I don't see any evidence in his own reflections or in his scholarship itself that any of that time in the archives was painful for him, quite the opposite. I think for him, it was joyful, it was exhilarating. And I think you can sense that in so much of his work. So all of this is allowing him to spend a lot of time in the archives to discover things that had never been seen before. Um, he is turning up boxes um, that no one had really looked at before, early church documents, uh, things like church financial, financial records, first presidency minutes, diaries, personal papers. He's transcribing them, he's cataloging them, creating an absolutely astonishing inventory that will be used by him for decades to come and also by other historians. And I think that even if that alone was what we had from him, it would be a monumental contribution to Mormon history. Of course, uh, what's even more significant is everything that he does with that research that he gathers there. Now, these developments about the church opening itself um, into um, historians, the archives being opened up, usually explained as part of the church's move to both professionalization and greater openness and transparency in this period. And I think that is absolutely right in terms of the uh, internal changes happening within the LDS church at this time. But we can also see those de developments as not unique to Mormonism. That openness and professionalism, professionalization is happening across the broad swath of Ameri American Christianity in this time period. So in terms of openness, an example for that would be the Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 1965, which is about the Catholic Church uh, going through this process of internal reform, very much guided with, with this spirit of we have to have greater openness. Uh, professionalization is happening, especially in Protestant denominations that are building up their bureaucracies and they're doing so with hiring people with PhDs in history and sociology, but also in things like marketing and accounting and psychology. This is happening across um, American Christianity in the, in the post um, or in the second half of the 20th century. Um, so all of that is context. Oh, and, and I just want to say quickly, uh, he goes on obviously to do his graduate work here uh, to, uh, at Yale where he writes his dissertation under Howard Lamar, uh, the great historian of the American West. At Yale, he works on this dissertation about the Mormon hierarchy. Uh, but he has a mini crisis of faith as he's doing this. He considers even quitting his PhD and perhaps even destroying his research if he feels like that's the right thing to do. So he prays about this to find out if that is what he should in fact do. And he says that he received a spiritual witness uh, to continue his work. And he said that from there on, he continued to pray and to print everything he published. Now, this dissertation, first of all, it wins two awards at Yale. 
including the Beinecke Dissertation Prize. This is a project that we've heard about already today. Uh, it's interested him for a long time because it has to do with the, the leadership of the church and also with his uh, frustration of how that leadership um, has often been talked about as a monolithic body that acts with a uniform voice. And Quinn knows that is not the case because of all this research, all the things that he has seen in the archives he's been looking at um, in those documents. He knows that um, from the start, there was internal dissension and disagreement among the church's leadership. And he's also seen in those documents the consequence of human actors as leaders. And so this dissertation is very much in line with his personal um, and his intellectual preoccupations when it comes to Mormonism. At the same time, his dissertation should be also in, understood in the context of the times, uh, particularly in the sort of intellectual debates happening at the time. This is the post Watergate era, a time of questioning institutions and investigating them, um, a real sort of skepticism to institutions, to authority, to leadership um, that scholars are thinking about. And so his dissertation is very much rooted in this sort of intellectual climate of the 1970s. So I think it's really important to remember here. So he puts this dissertation away after it wins this huge award. Uh, when he comes back to Utah to become a professor at BYU, he's pursuing a lot of his other um, intellectual interests, which we know are vast and, and, and wide ranging. But I think that he probably also put that dissertation aside. It doesn't get published into a book until, uh, what, almost uh, 20 years later. Um, I think in part because he understood uh, that this history of LDS leadership would be controversial. Of course, this is not to say that he's avoiding, avoiding controversy altogether. Uh, certainly the landmark work that he publishes in 1985, uh, this 90-something page history of Mormon uh, polygamy after the 19, or, excuse me, the 1890 manifesto uh, shows that. Um, I think some of the other works, perhaps like his book on early Mormonism and the magic worldview is not something that I would deem as controversial in the same way but it is of course absolutely groundbreaking uh, in its new investigation of folk magic uh, and the supernatural in 19th century New England. It gets the attention of religious scholars um, and it wins best book awards from several uh, associations. But all of this of course is being done under increasing pressure from church authorities and the end of those Camelot years we were just talking about, um, that, that decade before of things being opened up. Um, and there's many examples of this. One that's probably familiar to many in here is Boyd K. Packer's famous address in 1981 at BYU. The mantle is far, far greater than the intellect, um, where he issues these four cautions for those who write or teach history. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but I think just in sum, he, the po overall point here is that historians should be telling a sacred story so that those who hear or read it will, quote, see the hand of the Lord in every hour and moment of the church from its beginning to now. This is a warning against what Packer uh, sees as a, um, as a human-centered or a humanistic version of history. Now, Quinn takes this address uh, rather personally, and he gives his own address at BYU not long after, titled On Being a Mormon Historian. I really encourage you to read this piece of writing if you haven't done so before. I haven't looked at it recently. It is incredible. Um, it's an incredible text on its own. It's almost this point by point response to Packer's charges, but especially this idea that there's no such thing as objective history. He's just offended by that, right? He also attests to his own religious beliefs and how those are fundamental to what he does as a historian. You know, he, uh, he, he's saying like, I'm called by God to this work. There's no way that I could be aiding the adversary as Packer has suggested uh, historians might be doing um, even if they didn't intend that. Um, but that he's seeking historical truth that in his view affirms the gospel but doesn't create what he calls quote, benignly angelic church leaders which he says would border on idolatry. So he's like flipping Packer's argument on its head um, and he's, you know, especially when he's contending that these, quote, so-called faith-promoting church history, which conceals controversy, controversies and difficulties of the Mormon past, undermines the faith of Latter-day Saints who eventually learn of the problems from other sources. This is a bold and brave assertion. And again, for him, it is not merely the defense of objective historical methodology, although it is absolutely that, 
but it is also a defense of the faith, of his faith. Of course, this is a risky move uh, because it is um, perceived by many as a criticism of the church's leadership, and he's paying the price for that over the 1980s, even as he gets tenure and promotion um, at BYU. Yeah, he's winning the Outstanding Teacher Award in 1986, but the clamps are also coming down. And that builds to him leaving uh, BYU in 1988, going into hiding essentially for years, then being excommunicated in 1993, along with five other intellectuals uh, known as the September 6th, which we've heard, you know, of course, about already today. As we all know, neither leaving BYU or being uh, excommunicated kept him silent, quite the opposite. And I think it also emboldened him. I think it is likely key to his doing a lot of the work that he did in the years to follow, especially on sexuality and gender, uh, which I'll say more about in just a bit. Oh, I cannot because I don't know how to work computers, but. <laughs> What I just wanted to show here is what I think is really interesting is starting with the 1981, uh, what shall we call it, back and forth with Packer, and really through the 1980s and, and really for the rest of his life, and particularly in his excommunication in 1993, he becomes a media figure. Uh, Kenneth Woodward, who's a very famous journalism, uh, a journalist of religion for Newsweek, he writes this full page article in the 1982, where Diane Keaton's on the cover, uh, the 1982, February 1982 edition of Newsweek, where he calls um, Quinn's talk at BYU a stirring defense of intellectual integrity. And, and we see this ongoing coverage of Quinn in the years ahead. I think it is partly about what a um, fascinating character he is, a fascinating person. Also, what a reliable authority he is for uh, religion journalists. Um, that's a, something that's expanding in this time period. Religion is getting a lot more journalistic coverage in this time period. And as we've already heard from others, uh, he's a go-to person for um, journalists who are seeking to understand Mormon history. And of course, also, this is happening within the 1980s and 1990s, where Mormonism is of a much uh, larger national interest for all sorts of different reasons. Some of this are tied to scandals like the you know, Mark Hoffman stuff. It's also about sort of cultural representations, um, especially Reagan, Ronald Reagan and his sort of, um, uh, I don't know what we call it, his adoration of the LDS church. He has the Mormon Tabernacle Choir at his um, inauguration in 1981. Um, he praises the uh, LDS church welfare program all the time. So Mormon is more and more in um, a sort of national public conversation in this time period. And Quinn um, both figures in that conversation and helps shape it. Um, as we know, oops. <laughs> okay. All right, there we go. Um, he never gets another university job um, after leaving BYU, um, even though he's up, at professor, up for professorships at uh, certain universities. Uh, this 2006 article um, covers that, and I'll just let y'all read the, the quotation there on the screen for yourself. But again, I think this is part of the sort of ongoing media fascination with Quinn, but also this idea that um, because of what's happening in the American university around the rise of big time donors, particularly big time donors in the fields of religion and of history, almost all of whom have a conservative politics, uh, they are uh, using donations to shape faculty, um, faculty um, hirings, um, and of course the uh, larger implications of that of, you know, shaping curriculum and what's being taught. Um, that this is happening not just, this is not just a, a unique experience for Quinn, um, but that we can see this as part of a larger phenomenon of the sort of politicization of the American campus um, that is happening in the late 90s, and if you're aware of what's happening today, you know, only incre increasing through the decades ahead. Um, but I think many of the things we might appreciate about Quinn, especially given the fact that there's no institutional support, he's you know, cobbling together research fellowships, support from writing contracts, some, from friends, from benefactors, um, but you know, uh, persevering on his own um, against great odds. And I think that perseverance and dedication to his work outside of those, um, outside of that institutional support um, is important for us to recognize, and also how much of his scholarship is uncompensated labor or undercompensated, particularly. 
All right, I want to um, spend a little bit of time putting aspects of Quinn's life and scholarship in a more focused context of LGBTQ American history. You know, we have this like standard popular narrative that there is this thing called Stonewall, the Stonewall uprising in 1969. And is this like clear demarcation of time of before and after everything before it bad, everything after it getting better and better and better. And I think that Quinn's life and his scholarship complicates that neat before and after of LGBTQ history, because his life, like the lives of so many others, doesn't sort of um, stand in this before and after, but it suggests different historical cycles at play. And so we can think about his recognizing of his own different sexual identity at the age of eight, um, his marriage to his wife in 1967, his coming out to her in 1972, and their remaining married until 1985. We can think about those in lots of different contexts. It's often thought about in the particular context of Mormonism, and I think obviously that is relevant, but we can also think about what those, are ha what those mean to the larger transformation um, that is what we know of LGBTQ history that doesn't neatly line up with this sort of linear narrative of progress. Um, we also know, thanks to his own scholarship, um, that this kind of before and after approach or this like, things were bad and things get better, that there's this sort of linear narrative of progress is not um, the case um, in the LDS church's own relationship to homosexuality. But I think what is also important here is that once again, his sort of personal um, narrative, his personal life rather, is lining up with, a, with a, a particular timeline in Mormon history that's deeply relevant to it. So for example, 1952 is the year that he's eight years old. It's the year that he's identified as having the first sort of understandings of having a different sexual identity. Uh, that is the same year that the LDS church makes its first ever public pronouncement on homosexuality, deeming it an abomination. And as we've already heard from so many great talks today, this is just increasing in the 50s and the 60s through a development of church policies, of church theologies around this. Lots of publishing is happening around this. Again, this is not unique to Mormonism. It is happening across the entire swath of American Christianity in this period because the visibility and the presence of homosexuality is causing religious groups to have to um, articulate and develop a theology that for most of them wasn't there, or it certainly wasn't developed. And so again, this is happening really in, in every sort of denomination of American Christianity, even in mainline Protestantism and, and its more liberal wings. Uh, of course, against that, um, there's a, a political backdrop to all this, which is the lavender scare of the time period when the federal government is really cracking down, rooting out homosexuals who are perceived to be a threat to the nation because they might be turned into communist spies. That was a real thought that the federal government had. Um, so all of this is happening. Um, in terms of his development as a young person and a young adult. Um, and I'm just gonna move us ahead to talk about this incredible book um, that he eventually produces. It is very much, I think, a product of that history and a response to it. Um, and we've heard a lot about it and its argument already. Um, one of the things I wanna point out is it wins this award from the AHA for a contribution to public history. And I think in a lot of ways we can see this, um, this work in 1996 after he's left his position at BYU, he's uh, been excommunicated, that there's a way that he is writing to a larger audience and certainly scholars from uh, lots of different fields encounter Quinn if they hadn't already through that remarkable book about early, mad, uh, early uh, what's the magic, uh, you know what I mean, early Mormonism, the magic worldview, um, a whole uh, another swath of, 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 of scholars really from religious studies, gender and sexuality studies are discovering Quinn um, in this time period too. It is a um, part of this rise of queer studies and it is also one of the most significant contributions. These are three landmark books in this period that I think are sort of the intellectual genealogy I would trace that leads to his book. He cites all these books, of course he does, <laughs> He's always and, and many, many more, um, but obviously John Boswell here is a, like, I don't think Quinn's book, Quinn's book doesn't happen if John Boswell's book didn't happen first. This, this examination of uh, homosexuality within the early um, Christian church is a sort of foundational text that um, 
that Quinn uses for his own studies. And I think he situates himself in that um, and also offers this um, great new avenue of exploration to think about it in a context of 19th century Mormonism. Um, so I also think that that book is very much a product of the 1990s. This is a period of time that is both um, some real significant steps forward in gay rights, or at least gay visibility. This is the 1993 March on Washington. This is also the decade in which Congress passes DOMA. So all of this is to say is that the politics of homosexuality are like on the front page of the news of the day. And I see his work as rooted in that politics, um, responding to it, driven by it, um, even as it's exploring uh, 19th century America, 19th century Mormonism. What I want to do, and just briefly, is some spend some time in his um, in this these two passages. That I the introduction to this book is remarkable. Um, you know, this book is criticized for different reasons. Scholars, you know, critique how well he holds up, or rather, validates his thesis over the course of the book. Um, there's other critics who have other uh, 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 objections to it, to it, which I'll say something about in just a minute. Um, but the introduction itself is just this like amazing piece of writing that is like a clear articulation of a thesis and also a laying out of us of a, an intellectual thought process process that I think is so exhilarating to see from Quinn. Like the way he's working through all these sorts of different ideas and how he's gotten to the point of um, making the argument that he's made. And also it is an argument um, and it is a focus that is like a sort of historical product in itself. It is rooted in the 1990s. So I just want to like pay attention to this middle paragraph on page four. He says, second, I accept current research that indicates that like left-handedness, genetic or pre-birth factors determine whether some persons have primary sexual attraction for their same gender. Um, thus, even in the absence of written records, homoerotic desire has undoubtedly existed as long as humans have, exist, uh, have existed in sufficient numbers to allow a sexual minority. Then we go to footnote, foot, footnote eight. This footnote runs for four and a half pages, which I think just puts it like as an average Quinn footnote, <laughs> right? It's not the longest footnote in the chapter. There's one that's five and a half pages. Um, and I am a defender of the Quinn footnote. I, I love his footnotes. Um, in this footnote eight, he said, so he's just said, I accept the current research that indicates this like biogenetic origin of homosexuality. Footnote eight, however, for decades, I unquestionably accepted uh, the explanation that homosexuality was caused by neurotic or dysfunctional relationships with parents, which was the position of every book I had read and which was consistent with the family background of the one homosexual I knew well. He's referring to himself there, right? Yeah, um, and this is not the only time he's referred to him. I mean, in the, the, the 1981 talk at BYU, it's all in third person. Um, and so this sort of like dislocation from himself, even as he is the source of authority in this moment is fascinating in itself. But this footnote goes on for again, four and a half pages um, to lay out all the groundbreaking current research about the biogenetic uh, causes of homosexuality. This is an obsession of mid 1990s, early 1990s, mid 1990s science um, and, and popular coverage of the science of homosexuality. It's getting front page cover in dozens, literally dozens of magazines at the time. And you won't be surprised, uh, Quinn cites these texts on the screen and all the dozens more, because uh, of course he's, he's gonna do that. But what I wanna suggest here is this sort of mid 90s um, cultural and political um, fascination with the impending discovery of a scientific um, explanation for homosexuality that, you know, dot, 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 right? That will sort of, you know, prove everything is okay, right? That goes away for like really complicated scientific reasons I don't understand as a historian, but like it kind of drops um, off in terms of like scientific study. It also falls out of like cultural favor because I think there's a lot of pushback to this idea that there needs to be a scientific basis in order like for there to be things like acceptance and legal rights um, for um, queer persons. But um, again, 
this work is very much rooted in that sort of like politics of bio biology and genetics and homosexuality that's happening in this time period that I th think is so fascinating, but also that I think really um, doesn't date the overall work, but allows us to recognize it as this unique historical product. Okay, so quickly and briefly, but most importantly, I wanna speak to the, uh, the historian's legacy Oops, oh, we don't want to go there. Of, of D. Michael Quinn, um, as 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 uh, Ben said, um, I am not Mormon. Um, I uh, discovered quite unexpectedly that I had an interest in LDS Church history as a graduate student, which is a story for another time. I hadn't gone to graduate school. I mean, literally, didn't know anything about the LDS Church other than just like the brief things that one would pick up from again the sort of cultural fascination with Mormonism in the, in the age that in the time period that I was growing up as a young person, um, but stumbled into an interest in LDS history. And Quinn is the first historian I read. And for me, he is always the starting point. Like I can't imagine a different starting point to an intellectual um, relationship with this discovery. I I had in Mormonism. So I go, I start writing this, this, this master's thesis, um, and I go and get those, what at the time were the first two um, edition, or the first two in the series, the Mormon hierarchy series. I mean, what books to like check up, uh, check out as a graduate student, right? These doorstopper books, you're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to know something now when I'm done with it. And I think absolutely um, the contribution of those, the, the hierarchy books, um, for me, it, again, it's like, everything I know follows or flows from that, from that moment. Um, and I think in like, look, well, first of all, I'll say like looking back over all, all my own scholarship on Mormon history, which um, is not <laughs> vast, but um, there's a couple of things there, but I was kind of not at all surprised, but also just delighted to discover in not one of my book, or um, the several journal articles or um, book chapters I've written about LDS church history, not one of them, uh, let's see, I'm not gonna do this double negative. Every single one of them includes citations to Quinn. Um, and usually it's multiple citations to different works. I cannot say that about any other historian. And I don't just mean that in the field of Mormon history. I mean that about anything I've done in any of the areas of interest I have. And I imagine that is probably the same for many, many other Mormon historians. And we've heard a lot about his scholarship, its impact, um, its strengths and weaknesses um, throughout the day. His legacy as a historian is immense, especially his contribution and his shaping of new Mormon history. Uh, this ongoing interest, and I would also say a devotion to revisionism, to the archives, to documentary evidence, his prolific published record, his vast and wide ranging interests, these are his legacy. Much has been made about this today, um, but I think it is safe to say that Mormon history would look entirely different had there been no Michael Quinn. Or put another way, that the strength and vitality that I think all of us would recognize that characterizes Mormon history today, I believe is a direct result of what Quinn gave us. And I wanna end with two quotations that I came across and really just doing a deep dive into his life in the last couple of weeks, both of them that really sort of knocked me off my seat for different reasons. But I think that these two quotations really help us think about how, who he was shaped what he did. So this first quote, which comes from his unpublished uh, autobiography, which is quoted in Gary Topping's wonderful biography. Um, this is a sort of late in life reflection over who he was, and actually this is talking about the moment in which his parents divorced when he's five years old, and he believes it's his fault, that like something internal about him has been exposed um, and is the source of his parents' marriage demise. He said, I spent the rest of my life trying to be the perfect son, the righteous Mormon, the good student, and the perpetually nice guy in order to earn people's love and respect. I felt there was something wrong deep inside of me. It was such a hard quotation for me to come across because what a thing to express. Um, I think in it, we see the sort of unbearable personal standard of perfectionism 
the pressures of that on him in how he lived and how he worked. And I think, you know, it might also be a way not only of understanding his over-documentation, right, or his ex exhaustive approach to history and to historical writing, but it may also be a way for us having an empathy towards that. The second quote is actually the Michael Quinn I see when I read his works. This comes from a uh, December 14th, 1972 journal entry uh, that he quotes from in this article he wrote for the Journal of Mormon History in 2018. So he would have been, am I doing it? 27, 28 at the time, um, reflecting back on at this point would have been like a decade of work as a historian. And of course we know all the decades to come. But at this time in 1972, he writes in his journal, for over a decade, I have researched out areas, problem areas in LDS church history so that I might understand them thoroughly and be able to explain them with honesty and love. Uh, this is the Michael Quinn I see when I read his works. Someone who sought out problem areas, the puzzles, the inconsistencies, the mysteries of history, that that is what he sought out so that he could what? understand them and explain them, not so that he could topple structures or say, I gotcha, but that so that he could understand them and explain them and that he would do so with honesty and love. Honesty and love, love for history, love for his faith, love for his historical subjects. I think we see that in his writing and also, and I think especially love for his readers. Um, and I think he was always imagining a readership. Um, and I think we see that in a sort of honesty and loving approach to them. For me, that practice of honesty and love, it is the greatest legacy of Quinn's life and work. And I think it might also be his model to us of how we should pursue our work and our lives. Thank you very much. All right, Dr. Young has generously agreed to uh, uh, take some questions. So I will be moderating both from uh, the Zoom participants as well as those in person. So does anyone wanna kick things off with a question? Okay. okay, so when I was researching critical responses to Quinn a little while back, I see that um, there were a lot of Mormon scholars who were frustrated with Quinn, like there's this Quote that I love about how he used Quinn used the sweepings of the outhouse to highlight the malice. Mm -hmm. um, and so, from this outside perspective, using Quinn as your first introduction, like where do you see that balance of the hard parts and the love? Um, and how do you hold that tension in using that to kind of look at this this religion? Okay, so the question for the Zoom audience is. Uh, um, there's, there were criticisms from within the church that Quinn was using the, the, the metaphor of uh, the dustings of the, of the outhouse to understand the palace. So there's this inside outside balance and how does Neil as someone outside of that uh, dynamic uh, take it? Uh, that's a wonderful question. Thank you for that. I'd forgotten that um, quotation and, uh, but I, I, I've heard it before and I think it's a wonderful way for us to to think about sort of positionality here in a lot of different ways for, you know, first of all, just starting Quinn in his own position to his historical subjects in this time period, but also I appreciate it. And thank you for your question about, you know, what it might've meant for me too. I think that is not something I was aware of when I first encountered Quinn, because I really approached that um, book as almost like an encyclopedia that was going to teach me everything. And I don't think that that's a wrong way to see the Mormon hierarchy books. I mean, the, in the sort of comprehensiveness, again, for someone who's like, just see, like, what is the first presidency? Like, what is rebel, you know, like um, it was, I wasn't in the weeds of that at all. And yet, obviously that's something I came to learn very much about him as I wanted to know who this historian was, um, just who is this writer who is, who is creating these works that are so important to me and also recognizing that he was connected to some of the sort of political debates or political um, controversies that are arising in the time period that I was interested in. Um, understanding that what he was doing was giving me a particular um, 
that there was almost sort of like an outsider perspective of, of Mormonism that he was providing to me that could serve as a model of what I might do. I didn't even know I was going to be a religious, uh, a historian of religion when I went to graduate school. And so I'm also learning from him some of the skills of what it means to be a historian of religion. And so I think that's sort of, for me, what I ultimately see is a real balance of the, the sort of ugly parts um, and I guess I wouldn't even characterize it as a balance because I think that he was driven by historical truth that he believed he could find through the objective, um, hist through objective historical methodology and that he was going to tell the story that he discovered. Um, and in some ways, I think this sort of like, you know, balance notion replicates a framework of like, you know, good versus bad or, you know, um, that I don't think is how he thought about what he was doing. So I, I don't know if I've totally answered your question or if like walked around it in a much of different ways. Um, but I think for me, that is the real, one of the many strengths of what he's doing because he is seeing him, because he is writing this history that I think many can see as critical, but that is also driven by honesty and love. Like he's not looking to tear things down. He's looking to understand and explain them. And so um, I think ultimately um, that's what I feel like I take from him and what I see really as the through line of his work. Other questions? I do want to say, I got a question coming in from the chat that I'm going to give people an answer to think a chance to think about if they want to answer themselves, especially if any of the family want to come up and answer this at some point between now and the end of this session, which was I love Quinn's books and appreciate this conference and putting his work in a larger context. For me. I was wondering if anyone can explain what his personality was like. Was he a funny man? Was he short tempered? Did he have any tolerance for levity? Was he a good listener? Did he enjoy the sound of his own voice? What was he like? Not going to force anyone to want to come up and say it now, but if anyone, especially including anyone in the family, wants to come up and answer that question. Oh, Moshe is coming up. All right. Um, yeah, well, I mean, thank you for the question. Um, I'm Moshe, uh, the youngest. Um, yeah, really briefly, um, a lot of you probably know this, but I'm not sure if it's actually been mentioned. Tomorrow is our, our father's birthday. So happy birthday um, to Mike tomorrow. Um, you know, a lot like for, my, for myself personally, uh, one of the things that I've shared with a lot of people since um, uh, my dad uh, died last year is that in my life and with my experience with him, he, he, he was the best listener that I, I had. Um, and I have a very good listener in my mother and a very good listener in uh, my siblings. Um, there was a way that my dad was able to listen to me. Like, and I would talk to him in uh, moments of darkness and struggle and pain because of the way that he listened. Um, because he was just so clearly present um, and emotionally engaged, but not not imposing anything and not leading me anywhere. Um, and it, it felt incredibly supportive to me. And it felt like there was a great deal of empathy um, in that. Um, and I felt, I felt deeply uh, heard and deeply understood. Part of that I think is like a personality connection. Um, and not to go too much into like some, some personal history, but you know, our family, I, I have this perception that we're all rather different from each other. Um, my siblings different from each other and you know, our, our parents different from us and you know, in every direction. Um, we have similarities of course, and a lot of great love, but there's a lot of big differences there. And, and, and in some ways, like the way that I would feel things uh, emotionally, I think was just closer to my dad perhaps. And I think that's why I felt like he really understood me. Um, and he could be so supportive just by listening. And that's how he was supportive. He just simply listened and I felt, I felt like he understood how I was feeling in that moment. Um, and, and I felt, I, I always felt better. You know, I always felt better um, after talking with him. 
So uh, that's one answer to one of those questions. I, I think, I mean, for me anyway, in terms of that personal connection, um, he was a great listener. Uh, yeah, I also think it was incredibly funny. I think that other people might be able to speak better to that than I could, because I'm not a great person to relate anecdotes, which are funny. Um, I, I can be incidentally funny, but he had a really great way of telling stories um, that clearly he could tell again and again and again, like that kind of storyteller. And he just had good timing with it. And, um, and he was very funny. And part of that that I really enjoyed that I'll just share is like the last piece here is um, he had such joyfulness. Uh, and he also had a lot of pain. I mean, he really struggled with um, depression, uh, but he had such joyfulness. And, and I have so many memories, countless memories in my life at family gatherings or just being around him where he would just share a story, tell an anecdote, um, uh, nothing like, you know, it, you know, important necessarily, but just like a, an amusing thing that happened. Um, and he would relate it and, and he just had this gleam in his eye. Um, and he would usually be erupting with laughter, uh, no, not just at the end, but you know, at sort of like, you know, certain points along the way, just erupting with laughter because uh, it was just such an amusing thing that he was telling and it was really infectious. I mean, it's really funny to listen to him when he was telling these stories um, because they were funny. But the thing that I loved most was that he was just very joyful um, and uninhibited in his joy telling the story and um, not shy at all about, um, you know, showing and feeling the humor that he had and the amusement that he was feeling, you know, in remembering, um, you know, that experience um, or that encounter that happened in his life. Um, and it was that deep throated, like lusty laughter, you know, which is really just unmistakable. And something that I, I feel very grateful to be able to hold is that, that, yeah, the memories of all those, those moments when he would just laugh, uh, laugh uh, with that deep throated, lusty laughter, which just has so much feeling and so much spirit and so much heart in it. Thank you so much, Moshe. Uh, a, a comment uh, from uh, a few people in, in the chat to add to that. Uh, Ian Barber mentioned that Mike had a wonderful sense of humor. And like Marty, Marty mentioned this uh, at the last panel. Uh, he remembered his fantastic laugh. Um, Stephanie Griswold, a, a graduate student at Claremont, said he was kind and generous to even the newest of scholars. First time I met him, I, was, I just wanted to meet him, but he sat with me for a long while. He chatted with me like he'd known me for years. I think the students at CGU felt the same when he came to chat with us right before COVID hit. Thanks to his family for sharing more about how he was a fantastic human. Um, a question in the Q&A, and then we'll get back to questions here if you have them. Uh, Georgia B. Thompson asked, are you aware of scholars involved in other faiths who had similar rocky relationships with this historic, re with historic research into the history of those faiths, probably from the same time period? Yes, um, although I think the comparisons in a lot of ways point to um, lots of differences. Um, uh, I, I'm of course like I, every name has like escaped me. So I'll talk about this as sort of as a historical phenomenon. Um, but one of the things I was thinking about um, in the same time period in the 1980s and the 1990s, and it's not necessarily historians, although some of them are, but particularly in conservative Protestant denominations, and I'm, especially in the Southern Baptist Convention, um, in seminaries in the 1980s, um, there is a... Uh, Rooting out isn't the right word, but it's kind of the, the, the best word we, we can come up with here of what is happening, um, particularly um, around two issues, um, feminism, not surprising, um, and also of evolutionary biology. And um, this is not the same sort of direct, I don't think we should necessarily see this as the same sort of direct um, confrontation with uh, church history that one could characterize Quinn or that he was characterized as having, right? So they're not like writing exposés of the Southern Baptist Convention, although some of them kind of do. Um, but it's, it's more sort of the intellectual work they're doing around um, feminism um, and sort of gender, not sexuality, because that's like, they don't even go there, um, and uh, evolutionary biology. Um, and so they are rooted out. But interestingly enough, I think this is something that also maybe is a, a, a thing worth um, kind of pointing to a contrast that sort of reinforces some of the points I was making here was 
the, the rooting out doesn't happen internally, right? These, these professors at Southern Baptist uh, excuse me, seminaries who end up leaving or getting fired, uh, the, the start of that process doesn't start inside the seminaries. And it doesn't really in start inside the Southern Baptist Convention itself. It happens from wealthy donors who are, um, as I said, increasing their sort of interest and their involvement. Um, and obviously their shaping of these institutions through their financial givings in this period. And with that, of course, come expectations. Um, and so you have um, wealthy donors and also political activists, um, which should not be surprising if you know anything about what happens in the 1980s, right? So grassroots, uh, leaders of sort of grassroots conservative organization, organizations who are also Southern Baptists, like they're carrying out one thing on the political stage, which is you know, the election of Ronald Reagan, the rise of the religious right, et cetera. They're also carrying this thing out within the Southern Baptist Convention itself that ultimately calls for a split or brings about a split of the denomination into the moderate sleeve um, and the, the fundamentalist takeover is, is characterized. And, and seminary professors um, are kind of at the heart of that. Um, and there's a lot of high profile um, people who lose their jobs over that. But like, you know, this notion of excommunication or, you know, that doesn't exist in, um, in these, these religious, these other religious um, groups that I'm talking about. But I think we can see some sort of analogs there, even if it's not necessarily about like a direct um, confrontation or a direct, um, or if it's directly about sort of church history itself. Yes. On your line, you can also see that to some extent in your Catholic Church, yeah. uh, Ken's code uh, is that out in the pendulum that all is not all. Also, Rankin Brown, who was, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he was a, a great a Catholic New Testament biblical scholar. Mm -hmm. uh, he got along well with the Pope, but there were conservative people who did not like uh, the way he approached the scripture. Good comment from the audience about comparisons with Catholicism, some scholars there. Other questions? Yeah, go for it. So, do you know if you ever wanted to continue on uh, the early Mormonism and that worldview track? And is that at all counterexploited in the post archivist movement? Or that, because to me, that scholarship is groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is there any indication that uh, D. Michael Quinn planned to continue on with his research in early Mormonism, the magic worldview? Do you know that? <laughs> it's like, I, I, don't, I don't know that either. It's a great question. Um, that's not something that I uh, figured out through, through, the, through the recent work I did here. There might be others here who know. Um, but I do think one of the things we see over and over again is that this insatiable curiosity that is so wide ranging, um, I mean, it feels like probably everything was still on the table for him, I would imagine. Um, and, and we know that a lot of his, his um, explorations would go on for more than a decade, right? He wouldn't publish things, um, you know, he'd work on something for 12 years or, you know, he'd, he'd write a dissertation and he'd he'd put aside and publish it 20 years later. And I think that was about, you know, the things that I mentioned. I also assumed that he was working at it all along. Um, and, you know, I, there's a story that, um, I think it was Leonard Arrington who got on to him. Um, I believe it was Arrington was at, had, a, had tasked him with every Monday morning they met and he was given an assignment for the week of like something he wanted um, Quinn to figure out in the archives and to have a, a, a report written up to him by Friday afternoon. And, um, he, I think this was Arrington, I might have been, but, but um, he, he realized that like, he just kept seeing Quinn looking in boxes um, up until the last minute. And he explained, well, I, 90 to 95% of my work is research. And then, you know, five to 10% of the writing, like that he would spend all Monday through Thursday and, and Friday morning in the, in, the re, in the research. And then he would pound out, um, pound out the, the the paper that he would present to Arrington at the end of the week. So that not answering your question, but I think it speaks to like his interest and his historical his 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 process um, that maybe helps us um, imagine that 
that that was an ongoing work for him or think he, something he imagined returning to. I don't know if, if that was a comment that, that they knew or just a question. Um, and, I, and I'll also say uh, uh, Ian Barber has probably talked with uh, Mike about uh, this topic more than others. So if Ian wants to make a comment in the chat uh, over the next bit, then I might read it. Russ in the back. John, do you believe that you're I'm not. So, yeah, so the, just the, so the question for the Zoom audience was about historical fiction and uh, first was referencing Bardis Fisher, one of uh, the great novelists to come out of the Mormon tradition and who are the, uh, the great historical uh, fiction writers now to capture these important tensions. Do you mean within Mormonism or just? I don't know if I have an answer to that. Um... Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the, this is showing the limits of, of my knowledge here on, um, on this. Um, I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm blanking. Sorry, again, what was, what did you say? Oh, oh yeah, of course, yes. Um, you know, what I think is, um, what I would point to is the right, and again, I keep kind of making this point, um, through the talk was the sort of cultural fascination with Mormonism um, that in a lot of ways is really problematic, especially because a lot of it is driven by an anti-Mormon um, religious um, approach in the 1980s and 1990s. So thinking about sort of evangelical um, uh, treatments of Mormonism, which I write a lot about. Um, and so the sort of the documentary um, as a, as a way of telling about Mormonism, I think it's sort of an interesting thing to think about in this time period. And we've seen um, some good examples of that as well, but um, that's not obviously historical fiction. That's a different way of it's a, you know, storytelling that's uh, rooted or to some extent is rooted in evidence um, and in um, the historical record. Yes. So to respond to that question, it's not really historical fiction. Where do you go when I understand? In my case, someone who was a crime addict, if you want to see the crime, does not have historical fiction. He writes about the church in a way that I think some people find very disturbing, other people find very illuminating. But either way, I think you can get a lot out of what he writes about. I can't hear it. It was Brady Dawn. Yeah, and as Dolan, yeah, his evidence is who are you? So, so for those listening at home, the names are Brady Udall and Brian Evanson. Yeah, Brian Evanson. I have a question from here. If I could read it. Uh, Someone asked, and if you don't have an answer, I could give a little bit of an answer. Um, what was the relationship of Arrington and Quinn? What was it responsible for what ultimately happened to Arrington? Huh, that's, well, the relationship seems good from, from what, we've, what, I, what I've read and what I was just talking about. Um, I think there was a lot of admiration there. Um, and of course, Arrington, um, plays a role in his continuing, you know, he's going on to Yale um, and really making that possible, um, which is significant, of course. 
Um, I do think that Quinn played a part. In, so is the question, does Quinn play a part in what happens to Arrington? Um, I mean, this feels like when you look at this, I would suggest a little bit more of a chicken and that, or like, like where does one start and start? Like this is part of something that's happening um, within the church at the time. And um, I think they're both contributing to that, but certainly Quinn and his, um, I think the, the ways that he's pushing the boundaries here and sort of his doggedness. Um, I mean, he's getting noticed in the archives for what he's doing. And in a lot of ways, it's like, okay, just like go look at those boxes, but also like people are aware. And I think it's drawing an attention to not just him, but obviously to Arrington um, that probably has some consequence for Arrington as well. And then you may have some additional thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh just really quick and in, in digging into some of the works, I strongly recommend the Arrington Diaries that were published by Signature a, a few years ago, edited by Gary Bergera. Um, this chicken, the egg and going back and forth, I think is a really good metaphor. Uh, one of Arrington's first major problems in the church uh, history department was within a year of him becoming church historian and him sitting down at Mike's thesis defense, or maybe before, but he got Mike's thesis and he said, oh no this might cause problems. And he went to Mike and he gave him three options or he suggested three avenues. One, take out the controversial stuff. Two, find ways to cite the sources in ways that it doesn't tell the leadership that you're getting access to these sources. Or three, um, uh, sequester your thesis so that no one else can read it besides our committee. And Quinn uh, goes home, and this is in his diary entries that were published in the Mormon Historians volume a few years ago, and I'm sure will come out with the memoir. Quinn goes home disillusioned with Arrington. He goes, I, I, I just realized that I have a different perspective on what new Mormon history is compared to my, my advisor. Um, and then to kind of show how it comes back around, after Arrington is forced out of Salt Lake City and goes down to Provo and actually gets cut off from a lot of sources that he thought he'd be able to keep access to, Mike kept getting access to sources working on his polygamy volume because he had an in with some leaders in the church history library. So like randomly and probably in ways that some leaders might have regretted later on, he was able to still get access to sources when his mentor wasn't. Uh, which is just this fascinating, uh, it adds nuance to the personalities involved and shows that it's not just a clear cut story, which is it just, all right, other questions? Oh, that's good. Was Quinn right? Was it better to inoculate us? So the question is, was Quinn right? Was it better to inoculate the saints by telling the history than hide <laughs> That's what you came to answer. You want the non-saint to answer, yeah. You, you asked us, and I was going to say it depends on who the us is. Um, I think he believed he was right, and I think that's really important for us, and I think that's what I would really have us think about, especially as we conclude, that he believed in what he was doing. Um, and I think that is not, I mean, that's an easy thing to say, but it's not insignificant especially given all the pressures against him, not only of the institutional church itself, but of all the sort of social and historical pressures that I was trying to um, sketch out here and also the internal psychological pressures of him um, that in spite of that, or perhaps even because of that, he persevered with what he believed was his mission and that he believed it was a mission of goodness to you. Um, because it was one that was uh, rooted in truth, um, uh, supported by history, um, and that, again, was carried out um, through honesty and love. And I think that he, when I was saying he loved his readers, I think that he believed his readers um, were, you know, the, the vast um, pop, the vast um, body that makes up Mormonism, but he also understood that just like the leadership, it wasn't a monolithic body, that there were many different types of Mormons, many different Mormons, um, and that he wanted to reach all of them, um, and that he had a message um, that was especially to those who felt outside of the consensus of the church, whatever that might be, whether they be dissenters or people who had been excommunicated or people who felt, um, especially in this period, 
um, uh, a church bearing down on them around questions of, or issues of gender, of sexuality, of politics, um, that he was a voice to them to keep the faith um, and to keep the faith because the history, the historical record showed it was worth keeping. So my last name is Young, uh, but as I've said, I am not a Mormon, um, but that's what I see him doing. And as an outsider, I have a great respect for that um, because I think there were so many easier paths he could have taken, um, probably paths that he could have taken that would have given him a lot more public acclaim and favor, but that was not what he was driven by at all. And I think that is also something, especially in our moment of you know, people seeking fame and, and, and attention for all sorts of reasons, that his commitment um, to the work is, um, you know, again, that great legacy that he's given us. I don't think we're going to be able to top that much. We need to start cleaning up. So let me, uh, I have a few last minute things to do, but before I do that, can everyone please join me in thanking Dr. Young for one <laughs> And I do have a quick follow up on the question before uh, about Mormonism and magic. Uh, Ian Barber commented that with, that where Mike was going with magic in his view, especially given the, the 1998 revision of the book, uh, was moving beyond magic and folklore to understand uh, conformity and diversity in Mormonism. And that was the avenues that he took out. So he left behind the magic and folklore. And that was his new uh, research question. Um, one of the great ironies of, of that I had the honor to put together this conference is of everyone in this room, I might have had the fewest conversations with him. I think I spoke with him one or two times in person, uh, but uh, I'd always grown up uh, uh, appreciating his work. Uh, and one of the greatest developments over the last few years is that uh, he would reach out to me every once in a while through email, uh, to say something about my book or, or recent uh, articles or, or an essay or something. And I remember the first time that happened, uh, I'd, I'd published a, an essay in a newspaper and I got a buzz on my phone and I looked at it and it was a, the notification for an email from Michael Quinn saying, great job on the essay. And I screenshotted that on my phone and I sent it to my buddy, Chris Jones, who's in the back row. And I said, I've made it. <laughs> Because I think that that really like that captures the type of per the, the monumental figure that that Mike was for many of us, but also his generosity in reaching out to someone. Um, he would have turned 78 tomorrow. Uh, and my only regret is that we weren't able to do this conference before he passed so that he could see uh, this embodiment of the love and appreciation for him. And since uh, it was Maxine Hanks who first had the idea of this conference, I thought we would close with some comments she just made in the chat. Mike was prophetic with his urging of vaccination with the truth. He foretold what would happen without such vaccination and he was right. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. And may we go out and fulfill the legacy that Mike uh, wrought for us. Thank you. Thank you.